ourselves just for a moment. Don't look at me. On this, on this board, you will see there are many little cards with writing on. Underneath the clip, on most of them, it says, a Feldenkrais practitioner whoops, uh, can or something like that. And so there, you've seen some of these cards before in different contexts. These are the ones that relate to FI skills. From speakers, anyway. The aim of putting them on the board there is so that as you wander past, you can kind of glance at them periodically. If you see one that says something that you think, yeah, we've done that, I know how to do that. Not, I'm an expert at it, but yeah, I know how to do that. So, I, can't do that. I, won't, I won't show you an example. No, no, no. So you take the card and you put it over on this side of the board. You will need to move its magnet as well, but it goes over to this side. Now, there will be a number there that I think will be pretty much in agreement that we know how to do that. Once we start getting a collection on this side, you can look at those and if you think, I don't, I don't know that, I don't understand what it means, I don't know how to do it, put it back in the middle zone. Okay, so this is kind of going to be a negotiated process, but over the next two weeks, we want to kind of build up a picture of what we agree we know, what we need to discuss further, and what we agree that we actually haven't covered yet so that we make sure that there's opportunities to explore those things in the, in the next segment or between segments, or they might be things that you want to go away and explore yourself. So is that kind of clear? Yep. Ideally, by the end of January, everything will be on the other side. By, by the end of this segment, there will probably be a, a big chunk on this side. There may be at different stages during the fortnight, some in the middle that we can talk about together. And there may be, probably be a few that get left on the other side for next time. A learning organism, a single learning organism. <laughs> All right, well, we can stay there if you like, because we're going to. I'm just going to. Just going to. Oh Lord. Uh, I was I was driving myself nuts. Have I, I've confessed with this group how much I don't like saying just and how much I say it. Anyway, that's. We've all got our little crosses to bear, and that's mine. That's just my cross. So, um, you, so you had the homework about decision making, and um, we will ha we'll have a chance to sort of share about uh, what you noticed in yourself. Um, one of my favourite stories about decision making is um, Barack Obama, who apparently wore the same suit every day. Maybe I've told you this story. It's not exactly the same suit, but the same. He had I don't know how many of the same suit. Was it? Yeah. And because he had he, he had to make he just said well, that was so that he didn't have to make that decision every day because he had he had to make so many decisions in his day. That was one thing that he you know getting up and deciding what to wear was just a bridge too far. So he had the same suit so that he didn't have to make that decision took it out and then and that was that. I actually, I, when I heard that, I thought, what a smart guy because it doesn't matter. And then, of course, it makes him very, um, no one can read into his suits whether, you know, they're, you know, up or down or, you know, whether he's in a good mood or a bad mood or whether he's trying to impress or not. Like, it's actually quite, you know, ecumenical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's where it's not fair. Not fair. You have black socks. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
all my, all my stockings are black uh, and they've all got holes in them. But anyway, um, uh, and I forgot to bring my teaching shoes. Anyway, so that's, um, so decision making is an interesting process. Obviously, I'm interested in it. And it, it popped up when we were having one of the online shoots because of the, the some decisions you're having to make about um, the, the, the work with Bill's video, the video of Bill. And there was a really interesting discussion between a few of you and a few, and you had very different approaches to making the decisions that you did. And I remember um, one was like Gloria immediately jumped to a framework. You don't mind me spilling the beans about what happened in that shoot group, but you jumped to a framework to help you make a decision and whether you knew that or not, but that, that was your strategy and it was really clear. And everyone's like, oh, that's really interesting that you did that and you chose a particular framework and used work through the framework to help you make a decision. So that's one strategy. <clears throat> Sorry? Was it Spiff? I can't remember. And the Tom, yeah. So whereas other people might have a, um, you know, the opposite to that would be that uh, I use my intuition to make a decision. So what's intuition? Well, intuition is actually just that process, but it's subterranean. You don't, you don't bubble up to the surface. The factors that you're using to make a decision, they're subterranean. But people who have intuition are actually, you know, that's, they're experts because they don't, they don't consciously go through what are the factors that I'm using to make a decision. Um, we, we've had a... I don't think we've got them anymore. We had a research group at our uni who were called um, I4C, which was something for something for choice. I can't remember what the I stands for now. Um, and they do a lot of, um, you know, the forced choice experiments and stuff where they really uh, explore how people use different factors to make a decision. So, for example, we commissioned them to... Um, you know, we have to make decisions about who to, who's grant to fund, for example. Bear with this example. It's a boring example, but it's a benign example. So there are several factors that you would use, that, we, that you use formally. It's just a framework to evaluate a grant. Now, actually, what, what we do as people who read grants all the time is we kind of go, yeah, I like that one. And it's, what, what does that like mean? What, what is behind my like? Why do I decide to fund that one and not that one? So... We, you know, we have the framework, and then there's some, the hidden, the hidden frames. Sorry, the hidden agendas, which is really, I mean, in, in my world, this is a big problem because the unconscious bias is huge. And actually, I keep saying to NHS, it's not, it's not a gendered unconscious bias; it's geographic. But anyway, let's not go there, Melbourne. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so. So what they did with these discrete choice experiments was, not forced choice, discrete choice experiments was that, you know, let's say there's five known factors to make a decision about which grant to fund. And it might be, you know, scientific merit, it might be significance, it might be the track record of the, the, the people who are writing it, it might be, you know, value for money. And, you know, there might be five. So what they do is give you a scenario and these five factors, but in each scenario, you, 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 you weight the factors differently. So just like if you're choosing what clothes to wear in the morning, you've maybe got five factors like weather, who's going to see you, what activity you're doing, what's not in the wash. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's what's clean and uh, it, actually for me probably what's on the chair because that's more accessible than what's in the cupboard. You know, so there, there'd be five factors, and, but the weighting of those factors will change from one situation to another. So sometimes the weather is the key factor. It's the tipping point. You have to dress for the weather. Other times, like the weather, you have to ignore it because you have to wear the strapless ball gown because it's a ball. You know, so the, that is the, the, the occasion. Do you know what I mean? Or, or sometimes it's... There's nothing in the not in the wash. Nothing not in the wash, so you have no choice. So the washing, that washing parameter is the one that actually tips you over into the decision. So this is, this is kind of what I was getting at with that um, little exercise. And how, do you, how do, you, do you use a structure so that you systematically think through all those factors? Or is it you just go, well, it's a ball, I have to go to a ball, so it has to be a ball gown because it's kind of obvious. Do you know what I mean? How I've raved on enough, I'm, I'm getting that look. So what did you observe in yourself, Anna? Have we got the box to chuck? 
in yourself in terms of decisiveness and your process? What I found is that I make a decision on getting out of bed and in lying in bed and which way I'm going to, like I like to lie on my side for a certain amount of time until something hurts and then I move. But it's always I sleep on my stomach. Um, so in the mornings, I make a decision as to how to roll out of bed and it's sort of, I do it not quite automatically, but I'm, I'm always trying to move it so that it's really smooth and easy and I get up onto both feet and it's, I don't have any sense of jerk. So that's a decision that I've made to yeah. actually try and, I suppose, greet the day. Yeah. But it's not greeting the day, it's just moving into it. Yeah, so you could say that something that I'm hearing is that as a, a key part of your decision making is taking care of yourself. Oh, absolutely. As opposed to what yeah. are the other factors of getting out of bed is well, just as quick as I can or, yeah. you know, without even yeah. thinking about it. So it's totally habit. So if you think about habit is not decision making. No. Well, you, you're deciding to do a set formula because yeah. you, that's, so that's Barack Obama's suit. Mm. And it's perfectly fine to mm. use a habit. And he knows that he's doing it. Mm. So that's hopefully if he's going to actually go and dig in the garden that day, he knows not to have that habit. Mm. Yeah, it's more about getting, getting to a position that's easy, if you like. Yeah. So that there's not a... There's not a um, so I don't go past and go, oh, I've got to go and do that and sort of yeah. jerk out, which I used to do. Yeah. So it's changed. Yeah. But um, I suppose it will be a habit. <laughs> Well, it, and it's, that's fine for it to become habitual because it's, mm. it's fulfilling the need of taking care of yourself and preparing yourself. And actually what you've described is that you've, you're making a different decision now based on maybe your experience in the Feldenkrais method. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Because you've, you've bubbled up that you yeah. weren't making um, well-reasoned decisions about how to get out of bed in the morning yeah. and now you are because you've got more options and you understand more about what's possible and what's not possible and what's good and what's not good you know oh. yeah oh, without a doubt. so can you see that actually Feldenkrais is about giving people more options or more awareness of the options so that they can make more informed decisions they might decide to not do anything differently it's just about more more informed yeah um, when when you ask us to think about these um, things, uh, I thought um, in the what is automatic and what it makes me the decision to to solve a kind of necessity. Yep. Right. To I don't know. I need to go to the bathroom. I need to go now. So there's <laughs> no options yeah or, or maybe yes maybe yeah. i go later on then or not in this bathroom in the other or whatever but it's you know uh, address that uh, immediately necessity yeah hungry yeah physiological physiological yeah i, I, I get asleep what? <laughs> yeah <laughs> no um and then the other refined things that i say okay i'm hungry what i am going to eat yeah whatever the first thing i found could be, or uh, no, I'm more like fruit, or I'm more like bread, or I take care of my diet, so I'm going to eat this or that. Yeah, so they're um, all the factors that, yes. yeah, all the parameters that shape your, yeah. yeah. But, I, but I was thinking in, in this, you know, the primary things, because I was thinking of in, in babies. So babies, they, they need all the time things, no? And, and <laughs> <laughs> all the all the time. time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is one of the things when my when my daughter was born and I saw her is desperately need to you know to feed and and to to yeah to, to nutri nutrition yeah and 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 I was the the responsible to 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 nurture her right so yeah. this this is very very strong. Uh, a very strong thing in humans because it's it's like what we move us to do things sometimes it's the necessity and if you if you get to other levels yes you have choices or yeah. yes you have i was thinking also in in the, the people from the you know countries that they don't have food or they don't have water and they don't what make them decision 
drink a glass of water. Well, I need to walk many kilometers and found this clean water because the other is not clean and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And so there's a couple of things in there is that we are spoilt for choice now. We, you know, we've got decision-making fatigue a lot of the time because of our incredible wealth um, and the possibilities. You, you know, always, I always think about the supermarket and, you, you know, it, my mum would have bought a can of tuna. Now you go and you buy, go to buy a can of tuna and it's like, to me it's the epitome of the ridiculousness of our society is that there are, what, 50 different kinds of cans of tuna in terms of, that's right. <laughs> you know, and that in itself, that decision-making around size, country of origin, flavour, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And it leads to this incredible... Oh, yeah, that's right. You know, the ethical, the, you know, all those different factors now that we have to put into even choosing a can of tuna is obscene, really, in a way, compared to... Um, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's weird. Um, so getting... And then... <laughs> Your point about children and their decision making, it's very it's kind of binary, isn't it? You know, I, I need it, slash I want it, or I don't. So what happens as we get more sophisticated cognitively, and it's no surprise that decision making, you know, in terms of all the executive functions is kind of the end point. It's something that we develop over time because in order to to be effective decision makers, firstly we have to have the attention to pay attention to the right things get the right information we have to have a well-developed memory that can <clears throat> remember those factors and remember what we've learned about the importance of those factors and then we have to manipulate that you know sort of problem solving a way about well in this particular instance which of those factors that I remember are important are going to have which weighting and then I make a decision so it's actually an incredibly complex cognitive function You're, you're, yeah. you're reactive. Yeah. I said if we don't have experience, we don't exactly know what the outcome is going to be, so we don't quite know if that's the right option to take. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I remember um, someone very wise saying to me once, you know, if it's hard to make a decision, it's probably because you don't. It's not the right time. You don't have enough information. Yeah. So just bear that in mind, um, and and recognise that this is a skill that we practice, whatever the context is. Mm. Yeah, I think that that's what I noticed actually was, uh, it wasn't actually so much about decision making, it was all of the, so the first thing that, so we had to make a decision about the homework. The first thing that happened was I had about half a dozen, seven or eight different reactions. So they weren't decisions, they were reactions mm. and but as a result of those, those reactions, which was, you know, some four-letter words and then it was Come like, on. I know, I know. Who knew homework would set that up in a girl? Anyway. <laughs> I hope you directed them at Zoran. <laughs> and so, you know, I've been a teacher for a long time. I know what homework does. <laughs> So, yeah, so, you know, it was a whole bunch of reactions and then by the, the, the end of those reactions, and they all happen really quickly, the end of those reactions end with something like, um, what resources have I got? What are my resources? There you go. And that's when I then start to actually then go through some of the processes of thinking. Yeah. And having collected, the, you know, that, my thoughts in that way, then... I do the decision making. Yep. Like it's like the, as you said, the end point of yep. a whole bunch of other things yep. that just kind of are automatic things that, you know, happen quite quickly. Yep. Um, or not. Yeah. And how much I to get stuck on any of these points. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, you know, so there's a lot of other things that happen first reactions, processes. Yeah, this is a really important point because if, if you're presented with a challenge, or, you know, a fork in the road and you have a reactivity, 
um, then it's not, in a sense, a decision making. You've lost the opportunity to make a decision yeah, because so it's a reactive. That's what I noticed is that you capture that moment yeah. and go, okay, what's happening here? Mm. Oh, that's my critic telling me that yeah. I can't do this, this is too hard, why are they giving me you know, all this? Yeah. And then how, what does that mean? Yeah. You know, like have you even really looked at it properly? And you yeah. know, then they start doing all this, you know, so you have this little conversation in your head mm. before you even actually get to the task itself yeah mm. yeah so this is this is a really timely observation um as we as we get into you know the part of the training program arguably where there's some external challenges so you know we would we, we think that the whole training program is challenging however you know there's probably a perception that it's these kind of public facing activities that are more challenging am i right mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you like to share <laughs> um, so it is it is a kind of it is a kind of choice actually to to stay in the reactivity mode and we you know the the opposite of a decision making is a reflex there is no decision making in a reflex there's a stimulus and there's a response that's that is there's no decision making there's no there's nothing in there um and that's in a way what feldenkrais is about is not honouring the reflex or the reaction or the reactivity. You can notice it. You can notice that tendency, and it could be a factor in your decision-making process. And what do we do? You know, what are our strategies in Feldenkrais? We slow things down, which is what you actually just said in a, in a roundabout way. Not not root roundabout. You know, that that's inherent in what you said was you slowed yourself down because you, that's what we do in ATM. And then you explore, you, you come up with different options or you explore different inputs and you pay attention to the different ones. And then you make a contrast about what the influence of those different ones are. You kind of simulate it and you experience it and then you make a decision. I actually think this is best for me. It's best for me to, at the moment to lie down on my back. Julie. Yeah, just because um, you were talking then, made me say that I, I, I would share the way I make decisions. Um, yep. And it comes from uh, some professional development many years ago. And I think it was called when a positive becomes a negative. So you think of something like being trusting. Everybody nods ahead and go, oh, yeah, being trusting is a, is, is a good thing. But if you take it to one extreme or another, then towards one end, a trusting person might become a cynical person. You're going, oh, that, no, that's not good. And on the other end, a person who trusts too much might become a gullible person. So in making a decision, you don't want to be at either end of the extreme, but you might have a preference, depending on circumstances, to go towards one end yeah. or another. To me, that sort of cuts it fairly clearly. Okay. That helps me make a decision. So you, you sort of notice what the binary is or the dichotomy. Like you were saying. Yeah. yeah. The binary. Yeah. At opposite ends, at extremes, yeah. neither of which you seriously want to yeah. entertain, but it gives you a parameter to, yep. to work in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. And you might have several of those. Yeah. Well, it yeah. varies every time. Yeah. All the yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm going to ask you sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, my process is really interesting because what grabbed my attention in the end is how attached I am to the decision I've made. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, sort of life's pretty hectic for me at the moment and I'll lie in bed in the morning and make decisions about what I'm going to do to the day, for the yep. day, and then it's gone. And how do I react to that? how do I let a decision that I've made to do something go? Yeah. And, and how gracious am I about that? That's or I'm going to have a hissy fit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So th that was sort of what came out. It wasn't exactly about how I make a decision, but how do I respond when those decisions aren't fulfilled? Yeah. 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 That's really... This is something we'll talk about again and again when we talk about the middle part of a, an FI, 
yeah. is that you make a that you make a certain decision. Um, you know, like we're going to talk about the decision of what position to ask the person to adopt, and then you're going to make a decision about something or other, and then you're going to get feedback from that person, non-verbally or verbally or whatever, that this isn't right. So what do you do in that moment? And so in our, you know, when we're talk, talking about the um, the the competencies of an, a practitioner getting more and more experience is the ability to actually pivot or adapt in that moment is when things aren't going according to plan and we've all got plans but we can't help it we all kind of invest a little bit we have you know even a tiny degree of attachment to the decision we've made what do we do then when things aren't going and then how do we disengage from that decision and I've, I've, the, the word is pivot now i'm working with these marketing people it's all about pivoting it's not about adapting let's, let's say with adapt is at that the ability to adapt because it means that then there's a system and that you've responded to some feedback that your decision with more information needs to be modified or adapted or pivoted. And that can be overwhelming, you know, in an FI situation or so sometimes you kind of have to hold your line a little bit and sometimes you don't. So it's playing around with your attachment to your decision is a really, really important kind of aspect of the, of the lesson. And, it, and like anything, it can be overthought and it can be underthought. Um, and, um, you know, you, and the person on the table will feel it because you just get a bit relentless. But sometimes you'll make that call. Um, sometimes you won't. How vague can we be? Very. The box has gone on behind you. Yeah. I noticed, or I paid attention to when I find it hard to make a decision. Yeah, so right. I can get very indecisive yep. about certain things. And I was going, well, what am, what, I just broke that down and particularly around, you know, like what ATM to teach yep. um, or because so I've been doing some workshops, what ATM to choose for that or, you know, like the, the choice thing. And what I realized for me is that if it's a decision that involves just me, like if I go, oh, I want to do an ATM, I'll just, I don't care, I'll, I'll just experiment or do whatever one or if I want to eat something, I'll eat whatever I want. But as soon as there's other people involved and lots of choices, I'm like gone. Yeah. <laughs> so there's hundreds of ATMs to choose from and then there's heaps of people to teach them or, you know, other people to teach them to. And then it's yeah. like, I go all like, I doubt myself and then I go, I'll do that one and I'll do that one. And it's, so, so it's really interesting. Yeah. People and lots of choices and then, you know, like doubting myself a little bit. So it was just really interesting to notice that. Yeah, um, yeah, for me. That is, that's good. That's Why a really good I thing to work with. Struggle with the decisions. Yeah. And then you're, and what that, that says to me is your sense of responsibility. Like you're taking responsibility. Too great, yeah. probably, yeah. So because as soon as you're, you know, you're feeling like you're responsible for making the decision on behalf of other people and that's, mm. so you could, you could practice being irresponsible. Well, I did have a little go at it, actually. <laughs> Where I went, well, you know, this ATM would be good probably for six out of eight people. And those two other people, you know, it's not going to be bad, but it's not, you know, like you can't kind of please everyone in the group. Yeah. To, to the point of where, you, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a really good decision-making process. But I don't know. Yeah. I mean, maybe there is an ultimate ATM. You can just adapt to anybody for anything, but I don't, yeah. Not yes, sure. that ATM. Yes, we haven't taught that ATM yet, have we? The one that's guaranteed to work the same way for everybody ever. <laughs> oh, Ruth's going to teach that one. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. not now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I found, you know, you do all the little bits like the getting out of bed or the, you know, what to eat and... I found with most of my decision making, if I get to the confused point, unable to choose or whatever, then I go systematic. Yep. Yep. So for example, I had, I knew I had about six hours of painting to do one day on rails, like lying on the floor like that. So I know if I keep doing that with my right hand bent over like that for six hours, you're going to be sore. Yeah. So how do you swap that up? and try and keep yourself relatively even, all this sort of stuff. So I ended up, yeah, being quite systematic about it. When I lead left, I'm going to use my left hand. Lead right, use my right hand. But then, you know, systematically, all right, I'll pivot on my feet a bit this slow. And that way, I'll use my pelvis this way. And then that way. So it was, yeah, very systematic. So, 
yeah, it, it does bring all those things like comparison and yeah, it, it seems to cover everything if you do become a bit systematic yeah. when you're yeah. not sure about something, yeah. or for me anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it takes the confusion out of it, I suppose. Yeah. But it's only, for me, I can only do that because it was such a mindless job and painting. Like maybe, <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe you can do it, you know, in something. Maybe, th maybe those qualities can be, you know, brought into more intangible decision-making things, you know, around relationships or, you know, more implicit behaviours or something, you know, but it's about slowing down. It's about trying options. It's yeah. about... And paying I mean, attention, yeah. making contrasts. And you have to, because if you, you know, I'm not left-handed whatsoever. So, you, yeah, I have to stop. You know, how did I do that with my right hand? Yeah. You first go, I like splattered black paint all over my face. But that was it for the day. Then I got it. And yeah, yeah. great. So you sort of got the spontaneity within your, your structure that you've got because yeah. you've done something accidentally with your left hand to go, oh. That actually felt all right. So yep, that's, yeah, it's that's great. Mixing it all up all together. Perfect. Yep. Good. Uh, I was going to say, uh, just from a previous corporate geek for the last sort of twenty-five years, <clears throat> and certainly the last, except for the time I've been obviously out of work, um, working with a client where. As you are an out, as I was outsourced to them, you've got to think of what your, your what your own objectives are from your own back of house to yep. what theirs are, yep. what they don't want to go and do, what questions they're going to ask, and be prepared what answers. Be prepared as to what answers you're going to provide. So you sort of end up having this sort of organised sort of matrix of permeables yeah. dependent on and sort of almost the the, you know, the don't call me off, on or off type of thing depending on answers or not yeah um i've realized since i've left the corporate world yeah. um from going almost to i was from going from a almost sort of boiling the ocean to get to any permutation that might come your way it's just knowing that if that's your target and you're, and you're here provided they actually start you will tend to go and work out your right way depending on what happens along the way as to whether they're right wrong better or worse because of steps that you might have taken yep as in if, it, if there's a million different ways to if there's a number of different ways to to get to a point you've got to you know you can sit and, and analyze each one of them or go with one which seems most logical and then yep. you know you slice and dice it down until you get to your end point yep but actually it's quite interesting just that the, the two different ways of how you were taught to think yeah versus what you do when you're not under that that system and yeah work but, and you can apply that to an FI, in a way, well, um, you can have an yeah. Oh. yeah you talk, you, know, you talk about how that would apply in, in an FI context. Well, I, I was going to say, if anything, that's part of the uh, ah. moment that you get is the which way can it go? It can go a number of different ways. Which is then the right way? And and I appreciate there's going to be yeah knowledge and experience that will guide you further and better. Yeah, but there is that eek moment. Of, yeah. I don't know, there's 10 different choices, which one? Yeah. And eventually, at, at some point, you're going to pick one of them. Again, it's still going to be a, a narrowing of, of choice to outcome. Yeah. But yeah, that is one of, I guess that's one of the main questions of what do you do? Yeah. When you have so many different options. Yep. So. And I think it's, you know, you can, you can make a big choice decision that really commits you one way, or you can make a little one that's more neutral. That means you can pivot. You know, you can take a big step, or you can take a little step, and then see what the next little step is. The little step, but yeah, that's that's a that's a really interesting tactic, um, and they both work. So when you really don't want to make a decision, make a little one. Yeah. Uh, Chelsea inspired me by how people go about things. Um, 
I did a workshop once that was called The Living Enneagram. It's the ancient Greeks put it together, um, personality types. Um, and after the workshop, I knew what I did and it suggested once I found out what type I was, how I went about things. Yeah. And it was really interesting to take it to the workplace and watch the guys I was working with. Like, like I'm, I'm the guy that goes around and pays attention to all the detail all around the outside and puts a noose around it and then slowly tightens it up. Oh, yeah. Because we had <laughs> one guy, a really good arborist, but he would just run to the middle of something and just go spastic in every direction. Yeah. And then we had another guy that would was just brain dead and just chuff along. Yeah. And, and then another guy, a really good groundy, he, he would logically work linear he would go here to there to there to wouldn't deviate anywhere he just had this linear thing so it's really interesting to see that it, it comes back to the personality of the people is how they do it um and i'm sure we can change and we can yeah bring this and that's what the whole felt of christ method is about is making active decisions yeah um so you, could, you could just go straight to the middle and go spastic oh yeah jeff <laughs> yeah. that could be a choice or you could be Unreal. linear really talented i don't know yeah. how he survived yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 and it i mean and that's um it's not about any one process being better or worse than the other it's just they're different and different consequences and and maybe in different contexts it's fun to watch yeah yeah yeah, because that's it's got big implications for teamwork, hasn't it? If everybody's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, these these are, you know, you can you can set yourself a couple of weeks of working with people where that's what you notice about them is how do they process in that way, and then construct your lessons. You know, there's so many ways that you can, you know things that you observe in people that you can use to actually inform your lesson. You can, you can do it that way. But anyway, um, I, was for, I was fortunate enough. Um, weekend before last a birthday Barbie at my place and uh, an Aikido mate dropped around his book. Oh, really? Think, decide, act. Yeah. Right. And it's got, it's completely about decision-making. So it was just perfect timing. Oh, that's good. Yeah. But one of the ones I like the most is he talks about what he calls psychic Ram. Like, you, you know, you, you, your RAM on your computer, yeah. that if you've got so many decisions you have to make or so many tasks that are incomplete in your life, they all take up a certain amount of yeah, processing yeah. power. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess the ability to shelve things and just focus on one thing. Yeah. Um, like to keep on target in a sense, like, oh, this is the outcome I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. Um, helps eliminate a lot of the um, unnecessary the options for choices i guess yeah that's right and the unnecessary decisions in a way so i mean i would if you ask me what's one that you know one one of the many differences between a novice practitioner and an experienced practitioner is novice practitioners get stuck on a whole lot of different little decisions that, that in my wood language are not deal breakers like it actually doesn't matter whether you do this or that so and I like that idea. If you've got so much RAM, don't waste your RAM on the non-deal breakers where it actually doesn't matter. And, and so a lot of the, this sounds a bit like I'm being rude. It's not, it's just my observation is that some of the questions that you ask, oh, what should I do now? Actually, it doesn't matter. And that doesn't mean to say, I, I don't care. It's just that the person will react the way they will react. And whether you try this and they say this, or you try that and they say that, it's still information because it's such a, you know, a, a minor step. Um, and I know I'm speaking in the abstract, but maybe you can think of experiences. That's, that's the sort of um, what, what I see, the white noise questions. Yeah, and they're just that, taking up space. I guess that comes from experience as well of knowing yes. what, what, what's going to be a short-term solution and what's yeah. going to be actually yeah. a long-term yeah, right. and, and, long yeah. benefit. Yeah, and it's the experienced practitioner that, that can better predict what's a deal-breaker decision mm. versus a not deal-breaker decision. And I guess then a lot of that comes with experience, but it also comes with a bit of faith. So, for example, with Anna's thing about choosing ATM, I know that my answers are often very flip because I'll actually say something flip like it doesn't matter. Because in many ways that's true. Because a lesson has 
and I mean, there are some lessons, it's really important that you understand the crux of lessons, but there's so many different cruxes in the lesson. We were looking at the list that we compiled before we started this training program where we kind of categorise lessons into different categories. But on another day, I could argue that they're all in the wrong categories and there should be something else because it depends on what you bring forth in that lesson. So it is too flip to say that you can teach any lesson to anybody. That is too much. But on the other hand, most lessons have the essence of most of the important things of Feldenkrais and what, it's what you bring out of it that's important. It's the same in FI. Um, and, and it's not only about you, it's your responsibility. Whether It's what they choose to see, to feel and experience is important. And you don't have so much control over that. You have a bit because you can direct their attention and you can ask them questions that lead them towards certain lines of thinking and experience. But ultimately, what they make of it, what decisions they make coming out of a lesson, is that, is that, that's their process. It's not yours. You're sharing it for a while, but it's not your responsibility individually. Um, Okay, so I think, and is there any other burning, people have got anything um, that they notice about themselves that they... I noticed for myself, like oh, yeah. time of day. Time of day, like, yeah. And I know in businesses, a lot of people have meetings in the morning because in the afternoon, everyone makes poor decisions. Yeah, um, yeah. And for me, that, that, that can be sometimes like after eating a big meal, you know, having a, a lot to actually digest. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yep, um, yeah, it's true, yeah. it's true. What, what's the worst decision of the day? What are we going to have for dinner? Oh. <laughs> End of the day, get home. What are we going to have for dinner? Uh, uh, uh. In the morning. Guess what? Advertisement. Notice, no, this is sponsored advertisement, sponsored advertisement. Hello, fresh. So marvellous. Because you make the decision. You know, online. Oh, yeah, I have that, 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 and that. Done. Food comes. Cook it. Easy peasy. Anyway, that's so it's a decision-making tool. And, I, you know, you pay through the nose for it. But end of day for me, can't make it. So what, what's the easy way to make a decision? Hmm, Uber Eats. That's how they get us. They know our behaviour. They know when we don't want to make decisions. And so on and so forth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh. oh that's, that's fine. That's why it's like that. That's why it's like that, exactly. <laughs> um, well, um, not that I didn't know it before, but yes, the, on reflection, I, uh, I realised just how compulsively I, if, if I feel I have a lot of time, well, you know, um, if I can't see... A deadline in front of me I'm a compulsive information gatherer uh -huh. I put it put it aside till I've gathered more information right and then and then do you, do you overload or does it help oh I do overload yes yeah it, oh no it gets ter <laughs> terrible <laughs> yeah yes then this gets back to Julie's sort of dichotomy is if you do you, how much information is enough like too much information you overload not enough information you're like me and I make a hasty decision well, when the dead, it's funny that, though, isn't it? When the deadline is there, um, it's often quite a reasonable, turns out to have been quite a reasonable decision made on the deadline. Yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you, you know, that little last kick of adrenaline actually helps you make a decision. Yeah. It's an addiction. I'm ha I have had that addiction in my life. I'm slightly over it, but not always. And, um, yeah, so, you know, that's a, that's a strategy. That's a strategy that works like when the push comes to the shove or when it gets to the crunch, as it were, you make a decision. Yes. And um, I also thought of um, sharing something that I experienced doing an FI, but I don't know if that's, this is the time for it, but I might forget it later. Yeah, block it out. Um, well, I recently had, um, had the opportunity to do my first 45-minute FI. Yep. And also my first opportunity with someone I didn't know, although you would put her in the category of Feldenkrais supporter. All right. And, um, and so um, I, 
not having had a lot of opportunity to practice holds and you know getting myself cut myself used doing various different movements um I knew that I wasn't going to be terribly adventurous uh, and I, I stuck to a few things that I um, felt I was going to be happy with. And, um, um, you know, I, from my point of view, it worked out very well, but I, I knew that I couldn't go into thought mode you know, or I'd, I'd think, you know, what, what do I do next year? You yeah. Know, is this going to be good enough? Yeah. Or um, is anything going to happen? Or I'm going to start thinking, you know, um, will this, will this fix? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so I didn't. That's fantastic. I managed, well, I think yeah. I, man I managed fairly well to avoid that. That's yes. great. Yeah. That's great. So this is, what you've shared is a fantastic set of strategies to go into a process because you know yourself, right? You know, you've, you've done the hard yards in introspection and awareness to understand what your likely pitfalls are or what, what you're likely to get hung up on. And you have gone in with strategies to constrain them and help you manage. You know, I'm just stating the bleeding obvious. So this is the process that I invite you to think about, you know, and we've started it in the, in the online thing about getting, you know, the understanding your decision-making and when you get stuck and reactive versus not. And then what are some strategies? So you can go into the process with some strategies up your sleeve and some awareness. And awareness, what I liked about your story is, the awareness helps, but you don't, you don't let it trickle into self-consciousness. So, um, what's the word? Being totally self-absorbed and, you know, over self-conscious, you know, we're not like, overthinking. That, and, I, and I mean, yeah. that loomed, uh, that was, I, I was, con I was also aware of not, of, of keeping away from that because that it would have been something I could have fallen into. Yeah. 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 So this is the, this is, this is the process the embodied self, sense of self, you know, you, you know yourself, you know your tendencies well, that then helps you manage in situations either in teaching a class or in working with another individual because you know what's your shit. So then when something happens with them, you know, likely it's their shit. Do you know what I mean? So you, you're taking responsibility for yourself but not in this self-conscious, self-absorbed way, in this way of awareness that then you can be... Um, potent with the, the person that you're working with clean you know clean margins if you like so having discussed all of that and those of you who haven't spoken hopefully you've got some you, you've had some insights into your own process and when decision making comes easily to you and when it doesn't and what your pitfalls are and what they're not um, and it, it, it and it's any and all of those things related to personality and time and nutrition and and sleep and context and all the rest of it, um, in, in the context of they're giving an FI on Tuesday, um, firstly, you've got a choice. You can choose to get nervous and fall apart. That's a choice. <laughs> that's a decision-making thing. And that's reactive and you can live in that little world for a little while. And then you can go, okay, well, well what are some strategies? Now, for me, um, particularly with teaching, this sounds really If I can overthink stuff, and it's much better for me, that my strategy is to not think too much about stuff before, and which drives people nuts who are working with me. We were talking about this yesterday. I'm a team teacher. It's very difficult for me to team teach in that sense because I actually, if I overthink stuff, then I commit, and I'm a bit like you're talking about. I get very wedded to an outcome, and I want to do it, and it's like hell or high water, and I will just make you all do that. And that's not good because I'm a very decisive person. So I actually have learned to come in and be a bit more in the moment and let decisions emerge that way. And then I'm not as wedded to them. But it does come at a cost because it means that the people that I'm working with are a little bit like, what's she doing now? <laughs> what's she doing now? But, you know, so that's a strategy. It works for me. It doesn't work for 
Okay. So that might be your strategy is that you won't even think about the FI and you'll go in and that will be great and you'll use that. Others will go in and have a bit of a template, which is why we teach you a few recipes because it's a bit like, you know, getting home at the end of the day, what am I going to have for dinner? <clears throat> spag bog. Go-to recipe. Always got spag bog ready. I'm going to give a spag bog lesson. Knowing that this person is gluten-free, so you can't have, you know, that kind of spaghetti, you've got to have a different kind of spaghetti, or, you know, maybe they're vegetarians, you've got to make it with eggplant and not meat or whatever, so that you've got your recipe and you can adapt it according to the person that, you, that you're talking to. That, so that's having your framework, having a very clear framework, but not holding on to it too tight so that you can adjust it according to them. Other strategies might be simply to go, which is more what Kevin's talking about, is that you might not have a whole lesson in mind. You just say, okay, well, I'm just going to start with one question, one little tiny step, see where that goes, where that goes, then I'll ask the next question, then I'll ask the next question. So that is, you know, the true adventuring spirit sort of thing as opposed to knowing exactly what they want and, you know, like that. There might be other strategies, yes. I think it's better to work with people that you don't know. Yeah, I don't think I know. Well, I do think. I sort of know. <laughs> so you, you might know of them, but they'll be somebody else's friend. They might become your friend. No. Let's not go there. Um, so that's the beginning of that conversation. Um, I think, yeah, you've brought out a lot of really important points for you to reflect on and um, take, you've got the, a week to know thyself in that sense. If, you know, obviously you've had two and a half years of, you've had a lifetime of getting to know yourself um, and uh, maintaining that sense of, you know, the preparation for this FI is like the ATM is you go slow with yourself. You break it down, you pay attention, you contrast this versus that until you're kind of comfortable with how it is. Now, hopefully I haven't made it now. None of you were nervous about it and now I've made you nervous about it by overthinking it and talking about it too much. So let's look at one decision thing that might happen in an FI, which is I've got on the board here. What position am I going to choose? Now, I could be flip and I could say, oh, it doesn't matter. Well, it kind of does matter in as much as what, you know, you have in mind. But at the end of it, it's not a deal breaker because if you choose the wrong position, well, how, firstly, how would you know it was the wrong position? Because you're not getting information from your questions. That would be one way of knowing that it's not the best position. But ultimately, you know, you can learn to work with people in any position, uh, people who can't lie down, people who can't stand up, people who whatever. So get into groups of four. No reason why I made that decision about four. Totally arbitrary. Not a deal breaker. Don't care. See? Um, and list what... What are the reasons why you might choose one position or another? It might be comfort for the person. It might be that it gives you access to body parts. It might give you the opportunity to move in a certain plane. It might be that that's all you've got or whatever. Huh? You, you might. That's right. <laughs> The wank factor. Uh, and then we'll talk about what are the potential decisions you could make. Like what are the positions? That there's a, you know, it is a finite amount. There's infinite, not, almost infinite variations within them. But what are the sort of basic positions? And then someone, one of you mentioned, a bit, you know, you can get like a matrix of possibilities about why you would choose this given this given this. Why would I choose that? How about that? So those of you who like to make lists, this is a strategy. It's one of my favorite strategies. I am a very good list maker and then I lose them. <laughs> but that's another strategy. 
so make make a list of the possible influences or factors that you might consider in making this choice and then the possible choices. Is that clear? All right, groups of four slash five slash I don't care. It's not, a, not important. What, what is the important thing here is that everybody has a voice. <laughs> <laughs>